Hello, internet. I've just realized I should have tidied up my studio, but never mind. <clears throat> so, as I organize my windows, um, yeah, shout out to everyone on the YouTube chat. If you're watching on the HLCI website, then if you click open in YouTube, you should be able to see uh, the chat there where people are saying hello and saying what their weather's like. <laughs> um, so feel free to join in and um, but yeah, welcome to this, the second edition of hi uh, Hybrid Live Coding Interfaces. Um, we did the first one, uh, was it last year? Yeah, it was. Um, and uh, very happy to work with Kofi uh, Ajiro on uh, curating this year's um, workshop, which is over two days, over lots of time zones um, and for lovely sessions coming up. So this one is on exploring the world. Um, Kofi made a little bit of text to give the flavor of what we'll be doing. Uh, exploring the world with all its might. How does live coding add to this site? Does code look at world so bright? or fractions of a world at night. Live coding doesn't have to be viewed through the lenses of a computer screen. For the world lives beyond the area of where our desks reside. This session will not only explore the world, but the views that come along with said exploration. And uh, the, we've got four really varied um, uh, talks, which we've grouped together and under this session, one um, about errors in the world, another about caregiving, another about um, soul, uh, sound walking, um, and then a final one on, um, uh, let's see, just reminding myself, um, uh, reclaiming agency in a highly contingent algorithmically mediated world. Sorry, I didn't quite get through to uh, summarizing all the talks in a neat uh, couple of words, but never mind. Anyway, I should stop rambling now that um, uh, stream has warmed up. Uh, thanks for joining us. And I'm going to hand over to uh, Maxwell Neely Cohen to introduce himself. Are you there, Maxwell? I'm here. Hey, OK, take it away. Great. Thank you, Alex. Hi, I'm Maxwell Neely Cohen. I'm a writer and live coder based in New York City. I'm thrilled to be here among such great organizers and presenters. Um, and I am going to talk today about uh, what I would say is a very half-baked idea, um, but also uh, a little bit of an obsession, which is this idea of live coding the planet instead of hacking the planet. Um, for years, I've been obsessed with what are called public blue screens of death. I've collected pictures of them. Whenever I see them, I, uh, I make sure to take a picture. Um, this is when billboards or ATMs or ticket machines or all these varying uses of computers out in the world fail. Um, and uh, you end up just seeing some part of the system underneath these screens. And I've been interested in these long before I ever knew what live coding was, um, particularly how they're all over the world. I mean, here's on a taxi cab in London. Um, this is uh, in a train waiting area in Japan. Um, and this is long after Windows 2000 was a consumer product, let's say. Um, I've seen them in traffic lights. Uh, at the bottom of a traffic light underneath where you're not supposed to look, there'll be a little screen running Windows XP. Um, here's a, a really good um, digital bus station ad that's that's failing. Um, and I, I've just always loved them. I've thought they're sort of weird and beautiful um, and, uh, and, and fragile. Um, 
They also happen not just in cities, but in rural areas, which I think is really interesting. Um, they're, they're sort of everywhere. And uh, I'm not the only one who is um, obsessed with these. In fact, there's an entire Reddit dedicated to them all over the world. Here's just a, a live scroll through of various blue screens of death. Um, just everywhere in public. So this is what started this obsession. This is a cell phone picture from my first ever smartphone, I think in 2010 or 2011, when I was flying and I came across this ticket terminal um, in the airport where someone before me had seen that it was malfunctioning and managed to get MS Paint to start running on it. And various people over the hours had, had sort of started painting in this one failed terminal. And uh, I want a live code on this, I guess is, is where this instinct comes from. Um, this, is, this happened before I, I knew what live coding was, but that, that instinct is still there. Um, this idea that uh, all these surfaces are around us um, and they're even malfunctioning, but they don't have to be used for the, for the thing they were initially designed for. Um, so I suppose there's three ways of looking at what as live coders we can actually do with this half-baked idea. The first is something that live coding does really well is it shows that we can use the devices that dominate our lives for something other than monetizing our data and selling us things. The same tools that can be used to make someone dance or can make a, a surface sort of explode with light and color. These are also in a daily sense used for sort of these more normal capitalistic purposes. Can the fact that there are computers literally surrounding us at all times change the meaning or impact or feeling of live coding? What would performing on these surfaces feel like? Would it change how it feels to just perform normally on a laptop? I don't know, but I wanna find out. I, I wanna live code on a giant billboard on the side of a highway and I wanna see what that would feel like. The second, um, possible takeaway or direction from this as this ATM machine searches for IDE drives is what would it mean to design live coding tools that would be able to quickly be used anywhere on anything? I think that that's one possible artistic impulse to take from this obsession. Would it be possible even to uh, interface with all this stuff around us? I, directly, I, I don't know. I don't know how easy that would actually be, but I, but I do think it's an interesting question about can, can we design live coding tools that can be plugged into anything and used really, really, really quickly? The third direction that I think is really interesting, um, I think has a, a much sort of older history, which is can we allow the infrastructure around us to inspire our instruments and interfaces? So I, I lately have been telling a lot of people that live coding is an 1100 year art because in the ninth century, the Buna Musa brothers in the house of wisdom in Baghdad created the first programmable machine, which was an instrument designed to be programmed and played live, which basically recorded a sequence programmed it on these disks and then recreated it. And this is sort of a diagram of, of what this instrument looked like. And what was interesting about this instrument and later works of musical automata, like Dutch street organs or sort of player orchestras is they were usually inspired by the physical infrastructure of industry around them. So this flute was inspired by hydraulics, these systems for agriculture or gardening. Uh, Dutch street organs were inspired by these mechanical systems for industry. And I think there's a similar opportunity here. 
which is that there's not just um, blue screens of death that you see in the world. There's also these all other sorts of displays. Like here's a picture I took of a lottery machine malfunctioning and this weird 16 segment <clears throat> information panel malfunctioning. And um, in case you're asking, well, Max, what are you doing about this? The next thing I'm working on is to attempt to create a 16 segment display that can run Orca, that basically takes inspiration from those things in the real world and can run a live coding language on it um, to perform in it. So here is an example of this very large, I don't know if you can see my hand in the video, but um, 16 segment display that I've been trying to futz with to figure out if one, the translation can happen between code and this kind of weird display format. And two, if it can actually work in a live enough way. Um, but that's another possibility here is, is how can we sort of build new displays and interfaces that are based on all the displays and interfaces in the world? Um, so that's my half-baked idea. Uh, here's all my info. And um, yeah, I'm thrilled to take any questions you might have. Nice one, Max. Well, yeah, if anyone's got any questions, just drop them into the uh, YouTube chat. Um, yeah, thanks for that lovely presentation. Um, it reminds me of a workshop I did in Pixel in Norway, in I think somewhere around 2010. I'll have to try and remember who gave the workshop, but it wasn't about using displays in, in the environment, but videos, like um, those of these security cameras that um, shops have um you, it's just like and um, um, it's just an analog signal with no security and you can just pick them up with fairly cheap uh, equipment and and so the idea was uh, the workshop was about just um using them as cameras and like staging like dramas and <laughs> in shops and uh, just uh, using the security cameras as um ways of recording um so yeah i, I was just nice that there's all these screens around that we could potentially use but also all these cameras and we could put them together somehow <laughs> um i don't know if you've got any thoughts on that and um, what other sort of junk in the cities around us that are half working that we could use <laughs> yeah i think that's really interesting i mean i i um not to use the sort of uh hacker hollywood cliche but i i've always actually found it interesting when live coding gets confused with hacking yeah. Um, which which seems to happen a lot, and I know bothers a lot of people. But but I've always found it kind of charming, <laughs> um, and and potentially ripe, I guess, uh, for that reason. I mean, I think that um, I think that there's a lot in in the physical infrastructure that is both both digital and analog that that can be used in this way. Um, and I think you're yeah the security camera. Is a, is a really interesting example. But um, I've also thought a lot about radio. The, the, what, what radio does just as an audio source and a sample source is fascinating. Yeah, yeah, there's all these radio signals everywhere that everything's putting off, I guess. And it's just like this hidden layer of audio. So you just have a question from Nino. How often do you find these uh, public blue screens of death? Great question. Um, I think because in New York City, I find them, I'm in New York City, I find them quite often. Um, it, uh, almost every sub subway entrance here now has one of these screens. Um, they, they seem to be pretty common, um, but yeah. So I, I think it happens once every, about once a month is what I would say. Um, is, is once you, once you keep an eye out in a big city, you'll, you'll start to see them. Um, the best I ever saw, and I sort of quickly alluded to it was the panel was open underneath this traffic light and there was this tiny little screen running this when this copy of windows XP that was like melting down. Um, so, <laughs> so they're not just big, they can be very small. Yeah, it's weird when you see it on on um, 
on these devices, which are supposed to be really secure, um, like a, um, an ATM. Um, yeah, <laughs> that they can crash at all just seems to be completely wrong. Um, and Dragik is asking if uh, anyone did something with such a PowerShell. Um, yeah, I guess that's getting into the hacker side, at least the uh, side of hacker hacking. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask about sort of your future plans. You showed this, was that just like a single cell? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so could you, I, I missed what you're actually planning to do with it. Are you planning on sort of scaling up and sort of making your own devices that you leave around the city or? No, uh, no I mean, actually the, the hope is just to get a, a big enough version of it, 128 cells working. Um, yeah. That would just be a very different way of displaying code in a traditional live coding performance. I see. Um, okay. But it's definitely inspired by, by seeing those 16 segment displays in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm almost, yeah, I, I'm just as interested in how these things can inspire sort of more normal live coding performances than in sort of doing it in the wild, I guess. Um, but yeah, the goal is 128 of these 16 by eight, which is barely enough to squeeze in enough Orca code <laughs> that, uh, that it'll work, so. Yeah, that'd be lovely. Um, but do, would you think about doing like different arrangements? Like, and I always thought that this kind of rectangle that we have behind us in a live coding performance feels a little bit um, of a constraint. I mean, constraints are good creatively, aren't they? But um, if it could be any shape, it doesn't necessarily have to be re rectangular, then you could have a orca yeah. screen that was any shape then. In, in fact, the second version I want to do is just one really long line. <laughs> you know, I'm serious, you know, just sort of a single, like, like one dimensional almost. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, that'd be nice. Um, <clears throat> Okay, yeah. So Tiffany says, if you could code into the blue screens of death, it would be like digital urban graffiti. That's a nice thought. Yeah. Like coding as a form of digital graffiti. Um, really nice. <laughs> um, any question, any comments from the other panelists in this session? Or you're chilling out thinking about your own talks? You seem quite chilled out there. Okay, fair enough. Um, yeah, Shelley's suggesting having some spire angle screens. Um, I think she's thinking about the Algrave logo there. Um, cool. Yeah, I think um, Orc is such a lovely system. Um, it's, such a beautiful, beautifully constrained system. It kind of offers up um, these opportunities in a way, um, just to everything based on uh, these simple symbols that are so universal. Um, I guess the actual technology you need to create this is like the most minimal processor would be able to handle it. At least the run the running the user interface. That's the hope. <laughs> uh, it, it kind of makes me think of um, the whole kind of collapse computing scene that I think Divine is uh, tapping into as well. Um, so this is kind of an approach that would be quite good in the post-apocalyptic world, maybe. <laughs> uh, the slow apocalypse that we're exploring at the moment might actually end up in a point where um, maybe these digital screens are just they're just useless with the whole um, infrastructure of capitalism lost all we have is the technology left behind and it'd be perfect to use that for our live coding uh, screens <laughs> okay so unless there's other questions i think we should uh warm up for our next um, speakers. So um, a round of applause for Maxor. Thank you very much. And, thank you. Um, if you're coming to 
uh, this stream late. If you're on a different time zone and you're asleep while it's live, then feel free to ask more questions in the YouTube chat. Um, and we can check back later on and answer them there. Okay, so our next speaker has appeared, Kate Sikio, um, who uh, is going to take over from me now. Um, if you'd like to introduce yourself, Kate, then uh, take it away. Great, thanks, Alex. Hi, everyone. Um, good morning from Richmond, Virginia. Um, I'm Kate Sikio. Um, she, hers. I am assistant professor at Virginia Well Commonwealth University. Um, this talk might be short and kind of rambly because it's like um, a few different thoughts that I'm having around the subject of caregiving and motherhood and lab coding. Um, so here we go. I'll share my screen. And we. Um, so yeah, so minimize that. I'm a mom to Sam, he's three and a half now. Um, and live coding was a big part of my art practice before motherhood and um, still is. This is me about eight and a half months pregnant in front of a, um, a stack of speakers. This actually wasn't an algorithm event, but um, I played many, many algorithms right up to um, my due date. I think the last one I played was a week before. I like was waddling into these gigs, heavily, heavily pregnant and playing. Um, and then I've, yeah, continued to play afterwards. So I guess um, one thing about becoming a mother is like when you're an artist, people either expect you to pretend you're not. Uh oh, sorry. Hold on, I'm gonna have to reshare. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, I hope that's okay. Um, so yeah, everyone either um, expects you to pretend you're not a mother, you're just a work, you just are, you know, lab coding business as usual, or all of your work becomes about being a mother and becomes about, um, yeah like you see this a lot with musicians like they all of a sudden put out a kids album um so yeah there's like supposed to be this shift where all of a sudden because you're um, a mom all your work becomes about being a mother and i think there's like other ways to navigate this between like pretending you're not you don't have a child and making your work only for children um and the other thing i really want to talk about in this talk or we'll touch on um is that um we're going to lose caregivers and um, from the live coding scene if we're not um, careful. Um, this like this idea of like um, particularly mothers being forced to stay home um, to do caregiving um, because kids can't go to school or um, other things. For example, um, my son just started school, um, a preschool. And so because none of the kids can get vaccinated yet, there's no safe vaccine yet. Anytime one of them gets a runny nose, they're sent home for, um, for up to a week. Um, they have to get COVID tests since he started school in September, he's had three COVID tests. Um, so like at any moment, I have to drop what I'm doing for a week at a time. Um, so yeah, there's this real labor um, aspect that's been like, just like blown out of like out of proportion because of the pandemic. Um, so yeah, so my son's an algo baby. Um, <laughs> these are um, here's his first um, um, algorithm onesie from Suzanne, who I think is watching on YouTube. Here's a custom Sonic Pie onesie from Melody Loveless, and here he was at his first algorithm. Um, he was seven months old then. Um, here's a little video of that. <laughs> so here's Cody playing. Um, and there he is dancing with Ramsey. 
This was in Philly. <laughs> um. I think this is um, a really important thing too. He also came to talk. So um, there's a very poor picture of me giving a talk about what live coding is at um, Music Hack Day in New York City. Um, so like I flew into New York from Richmond with um, Sam strapped to my chest, um, got there. Um, this is like literally around the wall from this talk. Um, there was this other um, mother who was a grad student who happened to be working that day. Um, she started watching Sam with her kids while I was giving the talk. Um, and then other points during the day, Melody, um, who organized this, um, organized her partner, Dawn, to watch Sam. So I got to participate, not just give my talk, but also participate in other parts of the um, event um, because someone was there to watch Sam. Um, oh, and this is um, when he was 18 months old. This is him um, watching an old Cody video, um, eating an ice cream cone and dancing. Um, and this is something someone made after one of the algorithms. Uh, so he's been photoshopped into an electronic music setup. <laughs> um, but it's like, yeah, so all these things are fun, but this is what it looks like most of the time. It's not looping, but um, I'm trying to do something on my computer and he's trying to like smash bananas on it. This is like more reality than him doing cute dancing to electronic music. <laughs> um, so yeah, so why do I want my kid around live coding? Um, so particularly through Cody, so um, Sarah Graf Henning Palermo and Melody Loveless, so far in his life, his exposure to computer science is through women <laughs> um, and like amazing women. Um, so far, he only knows coding as creative and community or people-centered. Um, and he is learning software is ephemeral and doesn't have to be treated as a means to a capitalist end. Um, so I think we need to really, um, in light particularly of the pandemic, look at how we support caregivers um, within our live coding community. How can we find better ways to support caregivers who may be limited in terms of engaging with live coding? Can we normalize being a parent artist? Um, in general, the live coding community thinks about gender representation, but perhaps not how caregivers um, affect, being a caregiver affects being a woman more, um, especially during the pandemic. Um, and that was like a lot of old pictures of my son. So here's a recent one of him with his pumpkin. Um, so yeah, thank you. And I'm happy to, yeah, take any questions and discuss. Thanks, Kate. Um, just catching up on the chat. Cool. Right. Um, yeah, that's really nice. Um, yeah, it reminds me of when I see um, uh, talks given by thought leaders, um, male thought leaders, when they have that like slide at the front where they show their kids and how they've been inspired by them but there's very little representation about what that actually means in terms of caregiving or, um, or uh, the kind of, um, yeah, how, what actually becoming a parent means in terms of um, looking after children, um, maybe because uh, they're not actually primary caregivers. Um, so yeah, it's, it's good to think about uh, this. Um, uh, think in terms of the question, what's my question? Um, I suppose, yeah, 
do you think that you are um setting up sam to be a live coder do you <laughs> like do you think it's important for him to learn coding um, <laughs> maybe i don't know um like i think it's interesting that like he he, he's not that interested in computers and I don't actually encourage him using the computer much. Um, I try to limit his screen time. Um, so he doesn't really see it as something he does yet. Mm. Um, and like, it's not, yeah, I can like, like becoming a stage parent, really like pushing him into live coding. It sounds really funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> I don't see that happening. Like I really, I, his interests right now are more, um, yeah, he really, he does like music and he likes instruments, but he's really more into like the harmonica. He loves playing harmonica and he likes, um, he's like on a little, a little kid's soccer team. Like his, his, his activities that he's interested in aren't, aren't digital, um, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I guess we're talking about hybrid life coding here. Um, and live coding beyond the screen. Um, and your work has involved live coding that um, involves computers usually somewhere, but probably not really the, like, the main focus. Um, so um, I guess, are there other aspects to um, parenting that you think um, a live coding perspective can feed into? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Like, um, I think a lot of parenting is you try to like, particularly when they're little, you set up these like, what you think will be systems for them to like learn or like, oh, they'll like be contained in the system. <laughs> <laughs> and then they find a way to like, yeah, break the rules, destroy it. Um, <laughs> play, I mean, play is like his, like he talks about play all the time. All he wants to do is play, right? Which we, mm say we're doing in live coding, um, but he does it on such an intense level, like everything is about play. Um, yeah. Like he doesn't want to even take a break from play to like go to the bathroom. You have to like be like, no, you have to go to the bathroom, right? <laughs> like, um, so yeah. So I guess like in some ways we, yeah, there's like a lot of parallels into how we like think about live coding in terms of, yeah. Okay, we'll set up this thing and then we'll play with it and see if it makes something we like. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so there's a question from Nino. Would you have him joining you in a performance with his harmonica? Yeah, he asked. So we went to um, like an Oktoberfest a few weeks ago and there was a polka band playing and he kept asking when it was his turn to get on stage. <laughs> so he has that bug. <laughs> he has the performance bug for sure. Um, he's very social and he really likes people. So, um, so yeah, we'll see. We'll see if we um, form a harmonica code duet. Um. <laughs> um, but how do you think your perspective on this is different from a coronavirus perspective? I mean, you say he's a social person, but has that been restricted over the last couple of years? Um, oh yeah, I mean, he like, I don't know. I don't know if it's a result of him missing people or, but like, he just is a friendly kid. Like when we do bring him places, he'll just walk, like he'll just walk up to you and introduce himself. Like yeah. a lot of kids don't do that. <laughs> um, but he has no problem doing that. Like his first day of school, he walked into the room waving and like telling everyone who he is. Like if he's not a performer, he'll probably be a politician. Um, <laughs> he likes to work a room. Yeah. But that's just always been his personality. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking that my son's now 14, a bit older. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess uh, 14 years ago, I had the funny experience of seeing um, him learn how to use touch screens and then try and touch all screens. <laughs> like uh, try and interact with them. Um, I'm just wondering if uh, it'll happen with Sam, but he'll just expect to um, be able to um, change any system or any piece of code, if that's sort of presented to him as the, as the norm. It's just thinking norm. also about Maxwell's uh, kind of uh, um, 
discussion about a few screens of death in the environment um, sort of if when there's screens around him whether he'll expect to just be able to plug in and, and change it <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i wouldn't be surprised if that happens like i feel like <laughs> <laughs> cool <laughs> so any comments or thoughts from the other panel members in this session i think they're all staying quiet Okay. Yeah, I think a big thing I want maybe just to sum up as a takeaway yeah. is like this idea of support, like um, having someone there to pass your kid over to so you can go talk is a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> like be like having like, um, and I've done that. Um, I did a, I produced a live code event where we actually I tried really hard to get a, a babysitter off site and it didn't happen. So um, their child and they hung out with me in the back. Um, just to have that there is like a big deal. Um, it shouldn't be like an afterthought. It should be like, oh, if this person needs childcare, like we can, someone can hang out with the kid and it, <laughs> and it like, and it will be safe and friendly. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's a big deal that we shouldn't overlook. Um, yeah. In community. Yeah, I agree totally. Um, otherwise we are just locking out um, a whole range of people. Um, I think uh, it, uh, and it's actually not that difficult to do if you think about it right from the start when you're organizing an event, um, when you're, especially if it's like a funded event when you're fundraising, it's just something you add. Right. An accessibility fund. Um, it might not be that in the end there's a parent who wants to join, but then you might end up that there's someone who, um, is deaf and, and would like an interpreter so I think it's just kind of um, I mean these are very different issues but and, and you can't always foresee them but um, almost always there's something like this that comes up and uh, yeah um, yeah it, it should just be standard and normal and then it's much easier rather than something you try and deal with in the day it can be much harder <laughs> cool um, okay, we've got a question, one to finish with. What do you think of robot caretakers in the future? Is that the answer? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, interesting. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that kind of plays into certain um, ideas about our grave, which I don't know, we always live up to about being kind of this sci-fi future thing. Right, uh, yeah. <laughs> we're still the future 15 years later <laughs> um, <laughs> um funny enough i am doing a robot project right now but it is actually specifically about robot human teams the yeah. idea that like the human is never replaced the robot just helps you so the robot would never be the caretaker um the robot just helps the caretaker so maybe the robot would do the live coding while you did the caretaking <laughs> Yeah, I'm reading a nice book about cobots at the moment, if I can find it. Um, no, yeah, it's called Robotic Knitting. Um, you can look that one up if you're interested in uh, But yeah, I don't think robots won't take the place. They're just our helpers. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> all right, thanks very much. Thank you Kate. all. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's the one downside with these uh, Zoom workshops is that you don't get the applause after the um, talks, but um, I'm sure we all appreciate that. Um, so yeah, on to Hanani, would you like to um, appear as if by magic? Yeah, <laughs> thanks for joining us um, and take it away if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Hanani, I'm a musician, I'm a coder. I live in Mexico City and I'm doing a PhD in UNAM in Mexico. <clears throat> and I would like to talk about um, a project uh, around my research, my artistic research. So I will um, share my screen.
Okay, I would like to talk about the project uh, PSLCS or Portable Songwalk Live Coding System. Um, this is a combination of two artistic practices around sound that uh, involve sound work plus live coding. One is outside, other is inside. In my case, uh, combining these two perspectives, these two practices, I think uh, in the mediation of the song work practice through computational or computer technology. This uh, approach to mediate song work uh, with digital or computer technology uh, is not, uh, not new. There are a few Latin American artists doing this. For example, Flanus or La Caminata by Amanda Gutierrez. That is a VR documentary with 360 camera or the work of Sonod by Hugo Solis. That is an interactive work. Uh, it's a composition from some works that involves web, mobile and data technology or the workshops Electrosmog and Amplified Hearing by Christian Galarreta, um, who made these uh, workshops about uh, some works to discover electromagnetic fields in the city. In 2019, I was um, doing live coding performances called uh, Sonotexto. Sonotexto is a sound practice and a computational object I developed during my PhD. Uh, during these concerts, I open a microphone. The microphone is connected to my computer and I record uh, five or second fragment, fragments of sound. And then I live code with this uh, recorded sound in the moment. So, I'm interested in capturing sounds of the places, uh, of the architecture, of, of the people, the audience, uh, things that happen outside the venue. So I was doing these performances and then the pandemic uh, arrived. And I was thinking, how can I continue with these projects uh, with the same approach? during lockdowns. So I opened my window, put a microphone and capture sounds from the outside and start to live coding with this uh, for myself in my apartment. And sometimes I stream this uh, uh, practice um, for a live concerts. I start to do this uh, live coding um, practice in the moment, recording the sounds I hear and live coding with, with them. But little by little, I, I realized that there was many interesting sounds and I start to build a sound bank with these sounds. So my practice start to displace from the moment to the further sounds uh, to build this sound bank. And I start to reflect that or practices in this moment um, go from the stage in a venue to a screen in a, in a streaming concert. Uh, some of these concerts were Euler Room Equinox or La Hora de Life Coder by Top Lab Barcelona, Campamento Extendido by Posternura Records in Chile, and Algo Rey Brazil. I'm, Sometimes in, in the, during this concert, I try to replicate uh, the practice as in the present concerts, but little by little, I um, think that the stage is now the screen. The stage is the interconnected computers. 
even if the streaming happens live, like in this moment, um, we are not in a physical space, but we are in, we, we build with others the stage with the in, 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 interconnected computer. So I um, asked me if I want to, uh, to come back to do live coding as before. And I think, well, this is the moment to go outside the apartment, the studio, the venue, and do live coding as sound work. So I built this uh, apparat. This is a Raspberry Pi with a Raspi audio and a portable battery that I hold in my hand during my sound works. And I uh, have inside a super collider with a um, class that I written for record sounds. Inside, uh, I have a, a routine that uh, records uh, seconds, each 30 seconds. For the moment, I have not um, a button that allows me to decide when to record. I have not um, buttons, no keyboard, no screen. Uh, just this apparat and myself walking, hearing, I decide the paths uh, of walking from my daily life. So I know some interesting sounds that happened in, in these uh, sidewalks and avenues. So I just walk with this um, mini computer and the routine um, recording each 30 seconds. I didn't, um, I don't decide yet if I want to live code inside uh, coming back to my apartment and code with these uh, sounds or maybe coding in, in a park, stop and, and you, in, in the moment and start to light coding in, yes. But I need a small screen, a small keyboard, maybe some buttons to, to do this. But for the moment, I, I, I just um, collect the sounds. I have not uh, a performance yet with this um, system. I have to say that this project is in the very first stage. It's very unstable. It's uh, just uh, the beginning. Yes, I have uh, three ideas um, from this experience. The first one is um, that we can combine practices like live coding and sound work. The other idea is uh, that practices like um, sound work uh, are mediated by computer technology. In this case, when we combine with live coding, we are mediating the sound work with computers, code, and the third idea have to be with this session uh, that we have the opportunity now to go outside, explore the world through, through live coding, uh, not in, in inside, not in the apartment, in the studio, in the venue, but in the streets, in the avenues. And well, this is uh, the system and the practice I'm, I'm doing in this moment, I hope I can do like a performance in the future. I have an example in my, in my website, if you want to see later. Um, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thanks, Anani. Um, yeah, that's lovely. Uh, so, um, so at the moment you're uh, collecting sounds, but are you listening to the sound being processed while you walk? Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. No, I I just leave the computer without headphones. Mm -hmm. uh, that that is what one of the things I don't have. No buttons, <laughs> no keyboard, no screen. 
uh, neither headphones. I'm, I, I like to concentrate in, in hearing uh, with my ears and just leave the, the computer recording. In the future, maybe I need headphones. And also because <clears throat> Mexico City is, is a little bit hard to walk. It's also like an act of uh, resistance walking the streets of uh, huge cities. You have uh, to be aware of a uh, lot of things. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I, I don't hear the sounds during the sound walk. I, I hear the sounds when I arrive to my apartment. Mm -hmm. It's like to, to stage practice outside, inside. And yes, when I come to my apartment, I download the sounds uh, to my computer. Um, yeah, I, I have a small uh, fragments of sounds, like 10 sounds per sound work, five seconds. And I, I hear, um, I say, oh, okay, that <clears throat> could work for a, um, a piece or maybe it's, um, for a live coding session in the future. Mm -hmm. This is the methodology for the moment. <laughs> okay. Um, what do you think about collecting other data as you go, like GPS coordinates or, um, or is it just the sound that you're interested in? Uh, <clears throat> I have not think in collecting other sounds, but Mm, yeah, for the moment, I'm I interested in in sound. Um, the first uh, thinking was how how can I leave the screen? Was my first approach. How can I leave the screen? Um, it it was a a, a question of one uh, of my uh, uh, friends. A provocative question. Um, think how can you leave the screen to do light coding? And I was thinking this for months, for years, maybe. <laughs> and then with this uh, pandemic was an opportunity to think, uh, to be creative and okay, how can we uh, do light coding beyond the streaming? And yeah, I started to think to uh, to collect sounds, not with a recorder, because it, it, you, you can't do easy with uh, a sound recorder. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but uh, I, I know some projects. Uh, one, I show you some notes from Rosalis. I, I think uh, he do this kind of things um, with a cell phone. He records in, in the street and the, the sounds have this information also. But yes, when you when you start to, to program some projects, you start to complicate the things, and maybe in the future it could be a nice feature. To collect yeah. Um, yeah, it reminds me of um, a collective called Ten Ten, had a project called Life Coding, where they would just integrate coding into everyday life. Um, so maybe that's connects with what you're doing to some extent, like just going for a walk and taking the sounds of everyday life and then coding with them. Um, so maybe it's more about life than live. I don't know <laughs> if you can hear the difference on my microphone. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, just looking to see if there's any questions. Um, so one from Suzanne, um, uh, then Kate can come in after. Uh, does the city sounds perform and you're a part of that and later process live code this walking performance into another live coding performance? So yeah, I think Suzanne's thinking about the city having agency maybe, like the sounds are performing um, with you as part of that. Um, and then the next stage after this walking performance is the live coding performance. Um, I think maybe that summarizes it nicely. 
Yeah, that's <clears throat> that was my first uh, uh, approach mm. to do a performance, maybe connected with a concert, with a physical space. The concert start one hour before maybe. <laughs> I do first the sound work, I write to the venue, connect the computer to, to uh, screen, projector, uh, sound system, and then uh, live coding with the sounds. Also, one of the things I, I for what I don't use um, headphones is the, surpri the surprise of, of the sounds I collect. Maybe in this situation, to arrive uh, to a venue and perform with sounds just collected a few minutes ago it could be also this surprise to, okay, let's let's hear what what we have here in this uh, mm -hmm. little container. Um, yes, uh, it's it, it going to be uh, one of these crossover practices. I I, I think is. It could be a transposition of, uh, yeah, of things. Yeah, Suzanne says it's a collaboration with the city. Then, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Kate, did you have um, a question? I saw you pop up there. Yeah, yeah. I tried to. Yeah, um, I'm actually interested in like yeah the same idea, kind of like the walking as the live coding, and like um, like are you on the walks, are you employing any algorithmic patterns? Like, um, I'm thinking about like, yeah, like the decision-making you make as you walk or like, is there a map, right? So like that becomes the live coding is like actually the decisions you're making on the walk. And then the sounds just become a documentation of that. Oh, this idea is uh, really interesting. I have not, um... Uh, thinking about that, I use like a deriva, like situationist, like just go and let's see what's happening. Of course, the paths, the ways, the walk inside shoes is just in my experience, is uh, in my daily life uh, routines. But the other one could be also interesting to start this algorithm and okay, go and follow this, this um, pattern. Yeah, yeah, it almost reminds me actually of like, yeah, like the the sort of Mexico City approach to live coding is a blank slate, right? If you go out without uh, okay. where you're walking <laughs> in Mexico City, that feels appropriate. Um, <laughs> but like maybe there is a one where you have a plan or a route and then you get to, yeah, veer off course, um, which, yeah, I think when you do have a plan in live coding is usually what happens. <laughs> yeah. From scratch, some walking. Right, scratch from walking. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of um, trying to code with while also looking after a child as well. Um, there's only so much you can plan. Um, okay. Uh, I think um, that would be a nice time to move on to our final talk. Thank you very much, Hernani. Um, and there's Connor, if you'd like to introduce yourself and uh, take the rectangle. <laughs> Great. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Connor Cook. I'm a researcher, designer, and a dancer um, from the US, but I'm currently based in the Netherlands. Um, I'm doing my master's thesis at the moment here at the Design Academy Eindhoven. And today I want to present some, um, some thoughts that are formulating and leading to my thesis research at the moment, um, which is specifically looking at um, what I'm terming sort of the algorithmic production of space. So the increasing influence that algorithms have um, in the production of the way that the city is formed and operates. Uh, so my background is in architecture um, and my research specifically is on the relationship between technology platforms and urbanization. So I'm not um, actually a live coder. I would consider myself more of a lurker um, and a fan. 
But um, so I'm going to approach today from a bit from the outside um, and maybe offer a slightly um, different perspective, hopefully. Um, so I've titled the talk Live Coding is Critical Spatial Practice. And I earlier mentioned that my research is about the um, algorithmic production of space. So what does this mean? Um, the image that I'm showing is um, a visualization from a 1916 zoning re uh, regulation that was introduced in New York City. So before this, um, the construction of skyscrapers was not regulated by any sort of formal code. Um, and this resulted in a lot of tall buildings being built right up against the sidewalk, which functionally um, sort of choked all sunlight from accessing uh, the street level in New York. So in 1916, they introduced the zoning, zoning code, which essentially uh, mandated that above a certain height, all buildings needed to set back um, volumetrically from the street level. And what this image is, it's not a drawing of a building, but it's actually a drawing of the potential envelope that a um, building at a particular location in New York could have. So it's a sort of um, almost the virtual space that a building could occupy. And what this um, points at is sort of the beginning of um, essentially the shaping of an, the built environment, not by the designs necessarily of the architect, but through codes or protocols um, uh, sitting beyond that. And flashing forward um, 100 years into the future, urbanization and the production of space is now in an incredibly more complex and technologically mediated landscape. And what my research is looking into broadly is how different sorts of protocols, algorithms, um, abstractions lead to the creation of space. So here I'm pointing at the um, shape and um, sort of area of rainforests is in part regulated by the abstractions of carbon markets, whereas one could make the same argument that the, the shape of the suburbs um, follow also the abstractions of something like financial markets. So what I'm interested in, um, is what Keller Easterling, the urbanist, has titled infrastructure space. And she terms this um, to sort of give a word to the production of space through these sort of invisible infrastructures and protocols, softwares, et cetera, that increasingly shape the city. So she says, infrastructure space with the power and currency of software is an operating system for shaping the city. And in this quote, um, this sort of is my jumping off point to a more sort of speculative pondering of the relationship between, a potential relationship between live coding as a practice um, for visualizing or shaping the algorithmically mediated city. So if infrastructure space demands a new spatial practice. And here's, I'm asking if live coding in quotes um, can help make sense of the algorithmically mediated city. So again, I'm not a life coder myself. Um, I'm looking at the term life coding a bit um, more abstractly, which I've defined for myself as the real time performative authoring and manipulation of algorithms, but maybe asking if that can happen away from the screen or through its typical associations with audiovisual production, algorithms, et cetera. Um, so I'm gonna give four examples of maybe relationship between life coding in the city that maybe pushes too far to even being a useful definition anymore, but let's, let's see. So I'm sure many people are familiar with this, but this is a um, visualization of Project Cybersyn, um, which was a planned sort of um, cybernetic approach to man managing a socialist economy under Salvador Allende in Chile in the 1970s. Um, and I just include this here to indicate that this almost this fantasy or this aspiration of being able to live code and manipulate the data streams of a country or city is a fantasy that um, sort of has its origins um, quite a long time ago and is now again dominated by discussions over big data and smart cities, etc. But I found this to be um, a quite charming example in which these seven chairs in this interior space 
were designed um, to aggregate um, live streams of data coming in from a variety of telex machines all over the country, giving um, information about factory production, wherein the people within this space would essentially, in theory, um, be responding to this data in real time, making changes and um, adjusting policies accordingly. Um, this was never realized partially in, in turn in relation to technological limitations meant that actually all of the visualizations were drawn by hand. Um, and so this idea of real time management never um, fully worked. And shortly after um, the Pinochet regime um, overtook the government, this was uh, promptly destroyed. But um, much later, a contemporary example um, in Amsterdam, um, where I've lived for the past few years, uh, they've introduced this I Amsterdam city card, um, which is marketed to tourists as a way of receiving discounts on the main tourist attractions in the city. Um, but for the past few years, Amsterdam has been plagued by over tourism, actually, and the city, the city tourism department has shifted from marketing the city as a place for tourism towards the management of crowds, essentially. And so what this city card actually is beyond the um, sort of discount pass for institutions is it's a way of gathering data on um, the way in which tourists are moving throughout the city. And they've since introduced a corresponding app, um, which essentially enables the city managers to respond in real time to overcrowding in particular city attractions and send push notifications or discounts to um, tourists to try and sort of redirect them in, in, in different directions. So in a way, one could read this as a sort of live coding um, of the city. However, it's crucially missing um, maybe the most fundamental aspect of live coding, which is the turning inside out of the black box and the revealing of the workings of the code itself, because all of this manipulation and management is happening um, behind closed doors in the city. Um, another project that I, I found could be interesting in this regard was um, the Google Maps hacks by um, the Berlin-based artist Simon Weckert, um, wherein the artist uh, collected 99 phones, all actively using Google Maps, and pulled them um, on a wagon through a city in Berlin. Um, and in essence, this hacked into basically um, Google Maps auto-locating position where the algorithm will um, determine traffic positions based on uh, user data uh, in real time from the city. And what he ended up creating was um, sort of artificial traffic jams in the city. Um, so once again, this example, in a way, is a sort of real time performative manipulation of algorithms, but in and of itself, it's not text based um, and it's not really revealing the guts of the Google algorithm, but it, it is in a way a performative gesture that's um, sort of calling attention to the digital infrastructure. And as a last example, um, I, will, I will land with this quote, which is from Michel de Certeau, um, writing in 1980 about um, understanding the city as a collaborative manufacturer of a, a sort of text. So just reading, he says, the ordinary practitioners of the city live down below, below the thresholds at which visibility begins. They walk an elementary form of this experience of the city. They are walkers, wondrous manner, whose bodies follow the thicks and thins of an urban text they write without being able to read it. The networks of these moving, intersecting writings compose a manifold story that has neither author nor spectator shaped out of fragments of trajectories and alterations of spaces. So I think Hernani's presentation just now um, was kind of a perfect segue into this, um, which was, yeah, asking if we can, if we understand the, the city itself as a sort of collaborative linguistic manufacturer, uh, a sort of practice, um, what would such a reading mean also in the age of uh, Raspberry Pi devices, smartphones, et cetera. Um, so how can maybe we leverage um, the practice of walking as, a, as an act of uh, collaborative life coding? So thank you.
Thanks very much, Connor, for that uh, lovely intervention. Again, if you've got any questions, please drop them in the chat. Um, so, um, yeah, I guess it's interesting thinking about how live coding fits into, into this sort of idea of the city. Um, uh, I often think about um, Ursula Franklin on technology and how she um, divides technologies into technologies of control um, versus technologies of craft. So technologies which are about um, controlling people um, or usually at scale or um, technologies which are more about interacting with the world actually as responding to the world as, as much as controlling it. Um, and I suppose the Google Maps hacks would be kind of a technology, turning a technology of control into a technology of craft really. Mm. Because I guess once you have that, or well, those phones, I guess around you, you'd suddenly see that cars would be routed away from that road and then it would quieten, is that right? Yeah, I read it as a sort of, you know, if you want to make your street quiet, like just place yeah. a bucket of phones outside. But yeah, it's, it's a way subverting the algorithm in a kind of oblique way because the a lot of my research is looking into um, this notion of platform urbanism and the ways in which um, digital platforms are increasingly like something like Airbnb or Deliveroo or changing the nature of cities. But fundamentally, all of these uh, companies are very protective over the actual algorithms and the notion of being able to live code somehow this data is uh, something I, it's, it's not an easy task, certainly, because you can't really directly access the algorithm itself, but yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, so when you talk about algorithms, um, I, I guess sort of, a, um, I don't know if it's, uh, a bit overdone, but there's this um, classic connection between computing and architecture, um, which is um, the book about patterns. Pattern language, Christopher yeah, pattern Alexander. Language. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Christopher Alexander. Um, and he writes nicely about, um, about uh, patterns um, as, something which brings life to a city. Um, and it reminds me of this life coding idea that 1010 were exploring, mm. um, the, that buildings should have liveliness. I don't know if, if quite often these well-known sort of cases in a field are actually kind of uh, not, not so well respected within one, but I'm not sure if, if you could say something about this idea of pattern and how, how it fits to your ideas. Yeah, I think pattern language is quite re well respected in the field, although I would say it's it hasn't been forgotten necessarily, but architecture's relationship to technology has really, in recent years, really shifted from this macro scale um, that Alexander was proposing more towards discussions of complex formalism and parametric design, um, which is a bit of a shame in my opinion, because I think it's a lot of the ways in which architects use algorithms and digital tools are just to make very complex looking buildings. Um, whereas I think Alexander's project was much more open-ended, uh, much more sort of really thinking about the algorithm as a generative tool um, to be viewed on the urban scale and not from just the enclosure of one particular building. So um, in a way it's quite well respected, but although I don't think it's been so influential in influencing discourse and practice in architecture currently, which has been, I think, very distracted by almost another, not quite type of live coding, but very much architects, the practice of form finding in architecture um, these days is um, working within uh, space created by various parameters and is all about sort of tweaking parameters to find the right shape. But that's the question, that's the, the key is that it always ends on a, a shape because um, that's, a bit, I guess, the nature of architecture of it. But, 
<laughs> would be uh, nice if so. it could if it could not uh, not in there. Yeah, I guess um, it's nice to think of architecture that can change through use that um, that people can have control over the spaces that they live in, and um, it's kind of a kind of live coding as well. Just be able to reconfigure. Um, I guess all of these ideas that we're taking from live coding and applying somewhere else though have um, had a very long history, like the idea of being able to chain, have control over your life. And yeah. <laughs> it's, um, but I guess it's use, using the, um, uh, the sort of ideas from um, a sort of still, I think, emerging practice and um, applying it to something else. Do you think that's what's useful about live coding to you is that it's like a fresh view on these things in terms of our relationship with technology in our environment. Yeah, in a way, and also that it's um, like, I guess my argument is that the world is no longer, the direct modifier of the built environment is no longer the architect saying that they want to build something here, but is rather sort of an intersecting network of different planning policies, algorithms, um, mm -hmm financial markets, et cetera. So the very like mediating reality that is giving rise to the shape of our, our cities is, is um, I would argue, increasingly based on software. So for me, the way what I'm interested in live coding in relation to architecture is the way in which these, the sort of inner workings of these algorithms can be revealed performatively um, and can, can function as almost a, um, a critical tool. So I'm not so much imagining that l l one would be able to live code a city, but rather that live coding as a practice would maybe be able to make sense more of the impact that these um, algorithms are having on the shape of cities, for example. But yeah, it's a bit half-baked uh, pondering as well. I think it's beautiful. So is it then more a way to perceive the city that you're in by um, applying these principles sort of um, yeah. yeah I mean if, if it is I suppose this technology is like the smart city that um, I read about um, smart city technology in Sheffield where I live it seems to be mostly about surveillance and yeah. monitoring football and where people are going like in the example you gave um, but if we can, once we know the algorithms is there, we can interrogate them in different ways through these sort of almost like hacks, I suppose. Yeah, um, maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> okay. Um, so, any questions from other panelists or the audience? Um, Olivia, the author is Ursula Franklin. Um, the real world of technology that I mentioned. Um, oh, thank you. It's uh, on um, archive.org, both as a lecture recording. She's got a beautiful voice. So I, reckon, I recommend that. And also the book you can read on archive.org. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay. So thanks very much, Connor. Um, maybe we've got a little bit of time if. Um, Maxwell, Hanani, and Kate, um, if you'd like to reappear. Um, Jack, Kofi, and Shelley, you could uh, join us too if you want. Um, uh, hello. <laughs> yeah, thank you for this session. I don't know if there's any final points that um, I'd like to bring together, any sort of emerging themes um, about. Um, exploring the world that anyone would like to offer. Um, sorry to put you on the spot. But. I just want to know with the people that spoke today, if you're in how other people explored the world, how that affected how they explored the world, like what thoughts came in their mind, like how the intertwining of all these different aspects of the world, does it change how you view your own world or did it reinforce some ideas you had?
Any thoughts? <laughs> I guess uh, maybe to start off, like um, thinking about walking, particularly walking in the city um, and how that is like a, maybe a, a, a thinking practice and um, how, how we can have these sort of live coding interventions within that. Um, yeah, if we start to like conceptualize it as more algorithmic and how we can change, change that um, through walking through, through the city in particular, I guess in, this, in the case of these presenters, it was all urban based, <laughs> um, which is interesting too. Um, yeah, so this, this um, embodiment of live coding within these practices, I guess reinforces what I already do with embodiment in my coding, <laughs> but perhaps in the form of walking rather than dancing. Although walking can be dancing. <laughs> yeah, I had a very similar thought process to you, Kate. Um, and um, particularly just thinking about like how the uh, literary organization, the Olipo, were obsessed with derive, the idea of wandering through cities, um, and how that so often formed these almost algorithmic patterns of exploration, um, whether intentional or unintentional. Um, and I think that, that that's that's something I hadn't really thought of before, I guess, is, is the way in which that can be a pattern. Um, an exploitable pattern, um, or as you point out, a dance. Yeah, also for me, this um, uh, aware about the body, leaving the studio uh, with an apparat is not like stay sitting in front of a screen, but you have to take uh, in account uh, some uh, aspects where you put your feet, how you move, uh, to um, be more uh, into hearing that in into eyes. And I I really appreciate your perspectives about a city, coding algorithms. Uh, there are many things I have not reflect on. For example, this vision of uh, see the city uh, like algorithm patterns or this idea of coding the city or the idea of uh, looking something to project code like screens. In my case, like looking um, sounds from the streets. Uh, yeah, I, I I think uh, after this uh, conversation, I, I have many ideas so, to um, explore uh, through the light coding practice in the street. And Nani, your presentation reminded me of a thing that uh, my friends and I did during the lockdown, which was, um, we called them techno drifts, um, which was uh, one of our friends would generate a DJ set of one or two hours. And we would all put our headphones in and press play at the same time and walk through the city kind of in a, in a mob a bit. Um, and it was a way of sort of experiencing music collectively and also the, the ways in which sort of the unpredictability of the city would feed into this experience. And um, it was really, really fantastic thing. I, I would love to, whereas we were just doing this with the pre-made music track, soundtrack of one hour, I would love to see how that could be possible with uh, sort of real time um, interaction or feedback with the actual sounds of the city itself. So it just, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, that was a really nice uh, question to finish with. Thank you, Kofi. Um, yeah, it also made me think about the experience of walking with a very young person. Um, everything, it's like holding a microscope to the world. Everything slows down <laughs> and uh, you just see so many things that um, 
you uh, wouldn't see otherwise and interact with them in a different way. Um, and it's a bit like wearing headphones and listening to the world with the microphone, everything's amplified. And, and then when your sun grows up a bit and you go back to the same place, it's, everything seems so much faster and weird. And <laughs> what seemed like a marathon is suddenly just a very short walk. And, um, yeah, and the world, yeah, but the city is changing all the time as well. When you go back to a city you haven't been to for a few years, um, there's so many, yeah, it's, it feels like there's a new layer of technology on top of everything and um, things are constantly reconfigured. Um, it's kind of nice to think of this from a live coding perspective where we start to think about how we have agency over this system as it grows. Um, how we can slow it down, this change, and uh, keep it human. Um, okay, so thank you, everybody. Uh, maybe we should unmute and applaud each other because what I always miss at the end of these events is a bit of applause. So <laughs> let's try and. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if Zoom's audio algorithm is. Uh... <laughs> blending those uh, the applause together. Um, so big thanks to Kofi, Shelley and Jack who have uh, um, put this event together. Um, the next session is later today. Um, what time is that and who's chairing that session? Would someone like to jump in? And I am chairing that. I'll that go. is at 6 p.m. UTC. At the moment, I cannot translate time. I do not know why. I think it's at 1 p.m. <laughs> local time. Time zones have really been iffy for me, especially since, like, you know, some places don't do daylight saving or not, but that's a whole nother topic. Yeah. And the topic will be journaling, because, you know, with live coding, it actually is a journaling practice, if you think about it, because we are letting people see how we think and how we feel. But sometimes we talk so much about the code that we forget that, like, when everyone sees these lines, they are actually seeing how we feel, what we're thinking, the rituals that we have embarked upon. So for our session, that's what we're going to dive in, like the journaling aspect of live coding. And it should be interesting because the topics vary. So it's going to be a very interesting session, if I do say so myself. <laughs> Thanks, I'm really looking forward to that. So I think that's done in one and a half hours, which I think is universal unless you're time traveling. And um, yeah, uh, enjoy the next one and a half hours. And um, if you're following on YouTube, then be sure to load the next um, video in the playlist or just jump to the website and you'll see, see it there to watch. Um, yeah, take it easy. Thanks, everyone. And uh, See you soon.